namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto suchedo ye olahadi samyao samputo shiye. Namo sadanto suchedo ye olahadi samyao samputo shiye. Wushang shen shen wei miao fa bai qian wan jie nan zao yu. 我见见闻得受持,愿皆如来真实义. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, welcome to our Sutra lecture. My name is Hung Shur. Today is... Sunday, November 5th, and we're here in the Gold Coast Dharma Realms Buddha Hall. We're back in the Buddha Hall with the next installment of the Flower Garland Sutras Entering the Dharma Realm, Ru Fa Jepin. This is lecture number 39 in our series. We're on the way to uh, 40 lectures, and this, uh, uh, Lots of transitions today, where uh, tonight, if you're in California listening to this lecture, tonight at 2 a.m., you have to set your clocks ahead. Spring ahead, fall behind. Set your clocks back. Uh, uh-oh. Back. Spring ahead, fall behind. So it's fall there, so you set it back. Right? So uh, here in the Gold Coast, doesn't affect us, except to accord with you, we will shift our lectures from 12.30 in the afternoon on Sunday to 1.30 in the afternoon on Sunday, we're timed to 7.30 p.m. in California, Pacific Standard Time. All right, uh, welcome. Let's put our slideshow forward so that we can invoke spiritual presence, invite the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas of the Flower Garland Assembly, and as they say, the Tianlong Babu, who are going to show up in today's lectures as well, invite them to, to attend our assembly and to bless everyone, which is what they do when they show up. Namo Da Fang Guang Fu sound good in a classical guitar, something, something like Soar Tariga. All right.
Furthermore, we would like to respectfully acknowledge the Kumbumeri people of the Ugambi language region as traditional storytellers and custodians of the land where the monastery is located. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging as well as to all First Nations people whose sovereignty was never ceded. Moving forward, past the Pomo people, a uh, quick quiz for the Californians present Pomo. Where? Mendocino, exactly. A city of 10,000 Buddhas is known as Pomo Tierra. Uh, all right, quiz for the Californians present. Ohlone, Chochechno Ohlone people. East Bay. They are, uh, we, uh, in Emeryville, Shell Mound Road is where all the shops are in Emeryville. There were mounds of shells because the Ohlone had such a good livelihood pulling shellfish out of the bay. They weren't warlike, they didn't have to. They had everything, so. Only when the fight folks came did the trouble begin. Spaniards. Bells sound wide resounds Throughout a hundred million worlds The Buddha's law is heard and spread All throughout the triple world The wondrous sounds that everywhere Fill the Dharma realm with peace May those who hear it gain the strength to follow in faith the Buddha's path. Zheng Chuan San Qian Jie Nei Fo Fa Yang Wan Yi Guo Zhong Gong Xun Qi Fa Jie He Ping Li Yi Bao Tan O Hou De Park that and Welcome again, everybody. Uh, we're having uh, an unseasonal but very welcome heavy-duty rainstorm at the moment. We're all sort of damp here. and Everything seems in transition. Uh, daylight savings is changing in California, and the weather is uh, uh, changeable here in the Gold Coast. And it's welcome because we've, uh, we've, we're in a drought. Uh, El Nino has arrived, and... The last, uh, we had three years of unseasonable rain here. It's been very, very damp. We almost didn't have the kind of uh, dry winter that we're used to, dry summer. Um, but now time has come, and yet today we've got uh, heavy duty rain, which is going to make everything nice and green for a while. Um, let me remind everybody what's going on in the Avatamsaka Sutra. We're just about ready to welcome Manjushri Bodhisattva. He will show up uh, in the next couple weeks. Uh, and I, I will be taking a two-week hiatus personally from lecturing because of a trip to uh, Three Country Forum in Hangzhou, China, starting next, next week. Uh, but the, lecture, the Dharma wheel will turn. Uh, see if we can't maybe bully Marty into lecturing. Maybe he will cover. Uh, he does the Friday night of Atomsica. Maybe he'll do two weeks, two lectures a week. That would don't want to burden him too much. But uh, in any case, Manjushri Bodhisattva in the timeline of the Sutra comes next. And just before, we're just now at the, just before he arrives, what is happening is we're hearing the, the summary, the summation, the, the wrap up of the Buddha's praise of bodhisattvas. And the, the last couple of weeks we've been hearing about how they teach, expedient ways that they teach. That's been the keynote, Fang Bien, they call it, Upaya, which means essentially that the Buddha Dharma is very flexible. And 
it is not the case that uh, you have to correspond to a dogma. That's, that's a really interesting point. Actually, hmm, I haven't, yeah, uh, I've been collecting ways in which Buddhism is different from theistic religions. Um, just when that's appropriate point to make, often we'll be in conversation with, uh, for example, our Catholic monastic brothers. Um, we've, had, we, we've had in the past couple decades regular meetings with our Catholic monastic brothers, uh, from, typically from uh, the Trappist or Benedictine orders, and we're, we'd have week-long retreats or three-day retreats, both global, monks from, from Europe, for example, coming, or we've also had uh, national, uh, going to St. John's Monastery in Minnesota, or to, uh, to New Camaldoli Benedictine Hermitage down in California. We've had statewide Chan and Zen and Catholic meetings, and we've had local meetings within the Berkeley area. Uh, we haven't started that up here in Australia. We might look into it. But where we, when we do it, the, the joy comes in seeing the strengths and the weaknesses, uh, the struggles within a tradition, uh, or the, the conflict with modernity, that times have not kept up with the, the teaching. So in those cases, we collect how Buddhism and not just Roman Catholicism, but theistic religions as a whole are different. And one of those ways is um, in the founder, right? You, when you have a, a creator deity who makes everything, um, if the story has it that on the first day up to the seventh day, etc., um, it doesn't allow for that deity to ever be replaced. One of the strengths of Buddhism is that at any time you set foot on the path. Uh, for example, last night here, we concluded, here in the Gold Coast, we concluded a week of Guanyin Bodhisattva recitation. It was a Guanyin session, a Guanyin Chi, and the, of course, the, the daily practices of that session are focused around one chapter from the Lotus Sutra, Fa Hua Jing, the chapter is chapter 25, and it focuses on Guan Yin. It's the universal gateway, universal doorway chapter, Pumanpin. And the lotus is the, the big deal with the Lotus Sutra in, within, internally in Buddhism is that the Buddha at one point says, you know what, anybody who raises their hand in salute to the sutra, anybody who says Namo Buddha, anybody who bows once, to the Lotus Sutra um, will become a Buddha. That's all you need. There is a seed, uh, a proactive organic seed, spiritual organic seed that's planted in your consciousness that will f find fruition in you becoming a Buddha. That's all it takes. And that was a big deal because uh, when the Buddha gave that teaching, which is at the end of his 49 year teaching career, uh, a lot of, actually, 500 of those in the audience stood up and walked out. They were indignant. They were really upset. They said, you made us take the precepts. You made us discipline ourselves. We had to stop eating meat. We had to do all this stuff. And now you're telling us that that's all you have to do? Cheated us. They are really upset. They seriously were. And, and felt that somehow they had been forced or cajoled. No, no. They had been hoodwinked into... Uh, all kinds of effort. So clearly they got the wrong message. They somehow didn't get the joke. So at a certain point when your heart is good, you realize that uh, so-called bitterness, the kuo, is actually a sweetness that, and it's, it's every bit of extra sense softness that you accrue, you know, feather pillows and, and all, um, winds up 
muffling you to that degree from the experience of being alive. So if you look at people who actually practice asceticism, they're, they're usually totally tuned to, to each new breath because the gift of life itself is so present. Anyway, that's a story for another time. Here we are. I'm digressing from my digression. We're back to, yesterday we recited Guan Yin and the Lotus Sutra and that chapter from the Lotus. And in that sutra, the Buddha says, that's all you need to do. So, here we are. Um, in the, we're lecturing on the Avatamsaka, the Flower Garland Sutra. And these uh, bodhisattvas, uh, they're the topic, they're the, the, what the sutra is about. And the Buddha uh, has been praising them. He's been talking about how uh, they are teaching. They're, they're using upaya. Oh, okay, back to my thread. The, the idea was that in Buddhism, you say all you have to do is as much as raise your hand and salute, and you will replace the teacher in the future. That's a remarkable idea that the power figure, the authority figure, yields. He, in this case, a male Buddha, steps down, says, oh, time for a new Buddha. You're next, you're it. That's kind of remarkable in terms of being willing to yield the power. Uh, that's right, a peaceful transfer of power. Hmm. Now, uh, what, I just, what hit me just now is the idea that not only does the, the individual who is the source of the teachings happily steps aside and lets the new one take over, furthermore, the teaching itself is not fixed. If you have a dogma that is revealed, okay, here are the tablets, this is how it is, thou shalt not, and it's inerrant and never changes, then people have to adapt to it. What the Buddha is praising with the bodhisattvas here is all the ways that the Dharma changes to fit the people and it doesn't lose its essence, it doesn't lose the downbeat. We'll look into that more. That's just that I never put that together in those ways, but that's what upaya means, is that the, the teaching is so elastic and so inclusive and so stretchy that it can fit around not only different individuals but different genders it can fit around different species it can fit around different generations uh, and still take us back to our heart I think that's that's why somebody said well why is that the case it's because all of the teaching is meant to bring you back to your own mind and once you really focus on that mind, and that mind is just dynamic and changing and constantly creating the world outside, but most of us, even though our minds are busily creating the world that we walk through, we only focus on the creation and not the creator, the mind. So we're out there dealing kind of like chasing ghosts at the end of the projection screen. We're out there struggling with the, the images on the screen, not realizing that they're being projected from a machine up in the, the balcony. So, okay, there we go. That as our prelude, gee whiz, Dharma Master. Okay, here we go. This is, participants can see my screen, thank you. Okay, we're going to read this passage. Here we go. Palms together. If you care to join me, please do. Yi ru shi dang bu ke shuo fu cha wei chen shu fang bian man wang yi yi che zhong sheng zhu chu er cheng shou zhi so wei huo wang tian gong huo wang long gong huo wang ye cha qian ta fu Okay, 
Huo Wang, Ren Wang Gong, Huo Wang, uh, sorry, that Wang is a Wang, there's to be a third tone. Huo Wang, Yan Lo Wang Gong, Huo Wang, Chu Sheng, E Gui, Di Yu Zhi So, Zhu Chu, Yi Ping Deng Da Bei, Ping Deng Da Yuan, Ping Deng Zhi Hui, Ping Deng Fang Bian, She Zhu Zhong Sheng. Ready? Using the above skillful means, equal in number to dust particles, in ineffable Buddha Kshetras, those bodhisattvas traveled to where beings lived and brought them to maturity. That is to say, they went to celestial palaces, dragon palaces, and palaces of Yaksha, Gandharvas, Asuras, Garudas, Kinaras, or Maharagas. They went to royal palaces of Brahmas, royal palaces of humans, royal palaces of King Yama, and to the dwelling places of animals, hungry ghosts, or the hells. With impartial great compassion, impartial great vows, impartial wisdom, and impartial skillful means, those bodhisattvas gathered in all beings. Okay. Now, we've, we started out this, uh, this series by saying we were going to skim through the text in a hurry to get to uh, Sudhana's pilgrimage. That was our plan. And back when we had 10 bodhisattvas worth of verses, each with 10 verses, 100 verses to go through, each verse of four lines, uh, 28 characters, it made sense to hustle through, just to, to read it respectfully and to keep moving. This passage is so chock full of juicy things to explain that I'm really tempted to sl slow down and kind of share some of the, the goodies here. So let me, I'll hit, go for the middle way, in between. Um, try not to digress, keep, keep, the, keep the melody singing <coughs> as we go. So using all those skill and means, and what were they? Well, it was at times they use methods, at times they use methods, at times they use, right? We just been through 25 different skillful means. Um, how many? Equal in number to dust particles in ineffable Buddha Kshetras. That's an Abhatamsaka number. That's an actual number with zeros in it. How many? One Buddha Kshetra, a Buddha land. Uh, let's start, pick up a handful of dirt. How many dust particles? in that handful of dirt and pick up another handful. So you can say many, many dust particles. That's how many skillful means they used. Those bodhisattvas traveled to where beings lived and, here's the verb, brought them to maturity. The Chinese is cheng shoujir, cheng shoujir. In one way to translate that would be ripen to ripen those living beings. Now, let's just, just give one color, paint some, that's a black and white coloring book with the outlines. Now, I have crayons. I'm gonna co color in the lines. So it brings it, you can see what that means. Here's a perfect example. Um, I have only been to a casino uh, once in my life. In 1976, it was the bicentennial of the United States. And we had, we had to get to New York, I forget the reason why, for some event. Master Hua um, provided a $50 Greyhound bus tour, see Ameripass, it was called. The idea was for 50 bucks, it would, you could travel anywhere in America as long as you didn't come back. You didn't reverse. As long as you kept going, $50. You just showed your pass and hop on a Greyhound. And so we started in San Francisco and went all around the country for $50, myself and two other monks. Uh, it was quite a, quite a tour. And on the way back, we passed through Las Vegas. And uh, one of the monks uh, had actually grown up some of the years. His dad was an entrepreneur in Las Vegas, and so he had grown up. So he, we got off the bus in Las Vegas and went to a, uh, went to Harris, no, Harris is in Reno. 
forget what was the name, the Sands. Maybe we went to the Sands, a uh, big casino in Las Vegas, and for lunch, because they have buffet. They just put it out. And so, what a fascinating sociological study to walk into a casino and watch the behaviors of people. What, what brought me, what stopped me and just stared, were the, uh, the grannies at the slot machines. These were uh, women with white hair, uh, bad posture, in their 80s, who wore gloves and had a coffee can full of quarters. And they would go down the aisle in a trance, feeding quarters into each successive machine, pulling the handles like that. And they wore the glove because their hands would have been bruised and injured from the constant pulling of the handles. The third machine was spitting quarters out. They hit a jackpot. They didn't know it. They just kept feeding. The desire to hit the jackpot was stronger than actually hitting the jackpot. And there were uh, service personnel, staff in the casino who would walk behind the, these ladies. There were legions of them. Tap them on the shoulder and point to where the coins are now on the floor because they had been spitting out, or they won, but they didn't know, they didn't care. Then they would, oh, okay, they would go back, fill their coffee can with the quarters from the floor from the jackpot, and keep pulling. They were in a jackpot trance. And these poor ladies, you just want to go up and give them a hug and say, dearie, you know, you're being eaten by your desire. Just, you won, but you didn't even know. And, and, because, the thrill was in the, what was it, the endorphins that were released by the possibility of winning couldn't ever catch up to the actual, win, the winning couldn't, you know. So the expectation of winning was the point, not the winning itself. And it just, I drew immediate uh, connections in desire of all kinds. You know, the thought, they say there are eight kinds of suffering, eightfold sufferings, one of which is seeking and not getting. And there in Sands Casino, we added the ninth one, which was seeking and getting, is another kind of suffering, because why? It doesn't satisfy. It doesn't satisfy, even the winning. So it's called buyer's remorse, right? You just think, oh, I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait. And it comes and you go, I don't want it. Oh, now I have to wait for the next one. You get it, but it doesn't satisfy. So what's the point about bringing to maturity is the first noble truth. That first noble truth is so true. We are immature as long as we think that getting is going to satisfy. Maturity, how the bodhisattvas use all kinds of expedient means to wake us up, is when we go, you know what? I recognize that everything's going to come apart. Everything's going to come apart. And when we think we finally got the secure perch, this branch is going to support my weight, this is the safe branch, it falls apart. And that branch is going to drop me down. I still have to flap my wings and find the next branch. So. My goodness, mixing my metaphors left and right here. But the, the point is that we are immature as long as we keep looking for security here in a world made of conditions. And the Buddha wants us to wake up to that, but you know what? That's a tough truth. That's a hard truth to accept, that this, this thing is going to fall apart. It, it manifests in countless ways, uh, just the realization of our impending impermanence, the fact that we are going to die. Of course, you don't want to dwell on it. That becomes morbid. Then you become uh, somebody sick with the stench of Dharma. <laughs> you walk around saying, you know, I'm going to die. I'm impermanent. You know, think, Come on, wake up. Just, just, did you ever live? You know? So the middle way is the truth, but humans are maybe among the various beings in the, the six paths of rebirth, humans are among the few who can acknowledge in advance that our end will happen. 
They say devas, born into the heavens, they're drunk with the pleasures in the heavens. So chakra devanam indra, the who is corresponds to the creator in Christianity, uh, one of his jobs, as the Buddha describes it, is to wake up the devas. He's up there, and there's a fascinating, this is here, digression upon digression. There's a fascinating episode in one of the chapters of the Avatamsaka called the Shenshou Pin, the chapter of the worthy leader, um, the, the leader in goodness, strong in goodness, Shenshou, X I A N S H O U, Shenshou chapter, where the the celestial drum shows up. And this is Avatamsaka Sutra. And one of the bodhisattvas is saying, you know what? In the heavens, there's a special blessing that the devas have. And it just, it, it's one of the things, one of the perks that comes with being a, a god in the heaven of the 33 gods. And it's that you're there with the deva, the celestial drum. When the celestial drum pounds out two times only two circumstances will get that drum ringing bo booming and one is when the asuras attack <laughs> and oh my goodness we could especially with the next actually let me read the next line that is to say they went to celestial palaces dragon palaces and palaces of yakshas gandharvas asuras garudas kinaras maharagas so we're up in the heavens now. We're visiting Chakra in his palace. And we've heard of Indra's net. Indra's net is supposed to be this incredible, evocative uh, symbol of interpenetration. Uh, quantum physics is fascinated by Indra's net. Indra's net is this net adornment. It's just a decoration. Think of Christmas lights outside a house. And in the net, every time the net meets an interstice where the, the two knots, the two strings meet, think of a tennis net, volleyball net. In each of these interstices, there's a pearl. It's a perfect, perfectly round pearl that is translucent and also in some descriptions transparent. And the point about Indra's net is how it works is that in every perfect pearl, you can see the reflections of every pearl in the net. The entire net is visible in each pearl, and each pearl gathers back the entire net into one. So each one, it's one for all and all for one. D'Artagnan and the Three Musketeers, right? And it just, the net goes out and it comes back. It goes out, and if you have, if you have one, you have the whole thing. And this constant inter-reflecting through the pearl you can see all and yet each pearl is reflecting the totality of it and if only human beings could live that way so that we don't have to kill each other to fill some imagined deficiency so Indra's net is one mere decoration on the palace the celestial palace of Lord Chakra so back to our drum our drum what happens when the Asuras decide that they're going to attack, the drum starts to pound. Boom, 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 boom. Hearing the celestial drum be all the devas in the heaven of the 33 grab their psychic power weapons and show up at the front. <laughs> they're there to fight off the Asuras. And what's, this is footnote to that. If you look at Greek mythology, you have who? The Titans fighting for control of Mount Olympus. Identical fashion. You think, hmm, could these myths overlap? Hmm. There's a master's thesis or a PhD dissertation for anybody who wants to do the work. Give me a credit in your acknowledgments. So, we have Asuras and Devas fighting for control of the heaven of the 33, the tri of heaven. We have Titans and gods fighting for control of Mount Olympus in Greek mythology. And of course, the mythology of India and the mythology of Greece overlapped. 
in the Gandhara region. So maybe those stories got, got retold. Who knows? All right. The second time, the second time the celestial drum pounds out is when Lord Chakra wants the devas to come hear the Dharma. It's the Dharma lecture. Boom, boom, boom. Why? He wants to wake them up and say, how comfortable is your life here in the heaven? You happy? It's not going to last. Cultivate. Because you're going to fall if you don't. Your blessings will run out. It's like a bank account. You'll use them up and you fall. So, wake up. That's what the celestial drum does. It's, uh, it, ring, it pounds, sounds out twice. Once when there's an attack by the Asuras and once when it's time to hear the Dharma. How about that? So that chapter is such a good chapter, the Shinsho chapter. There's lots of other goodies in it. It actually, that chapter tells about warfare in the heavens. It describes the weapons that Lord Chakra uses to fight the Asuras who are fearsome. The Asuras are scary dudes. So I'll, I'll leave that for another time. So celestial palaces, here's bringing them to maturity. When you bring beings to maturity, if they're mature, they, particularly if they're humans, they can know that their end will come at some point and they don't freak out. Um, I look at the birds that land on my, on my deck and I wonder if they know that their, you know, the lives of animals are, are short in comparison, except our, our parrots, my goodness, the cockatoos can live to be 20 and more. So, are humans the only species that know that we will die? Um, even, here's an example, um, when Shakyamuni Buddha skipped over the, the palace wall and went out into the bush into the forest around the palace in Magadha, up there in northeastern India, um, he woke up suddenly. He recognized that the delights of his palace, which were, my goodness, uh, sybaritic, he really had, he was affluent to the max, and yet he saw that all of that once he got old, once he got sick, once he died, we're going to avail him not at all. So he left to bring himself to maturity. Talk about courageous. Um, so he did. He woke up, and there he was. Uh, five of his relatives had been sent out to bring him back. The, the five bhikshus who chased after him were his cousins and relatives and of course they were upset because they had been sent out bring him back or you don't return oh no this jerk he's out there why couldn't he just enjoy his wife and his parties and his soldiers and his elephants he had to run away well they came out and they were he was busily meditating under the Bodhi tree and he there was a big, I don't want to go too deep into that story, but all five had abandoned him. Two of them, because they thought he was too soft, that he had quit on his asceticism. Three of them, because they couldn't stand it. They thought he was too hard, he was too ascetic. So the five of them were off in what was called the Deer Wilds Park. And even though they were there at the same time as the Buddha, they still could not come to maturity. That's how hard it is for bodhisattvas expediently to wake us up, to make us, make us see the reality of a world made of conditions. And the conditions come together and they fall apart. All right. So the Buddha wakes up under the Bodhi tree, sets out to find those five relatives and to wake them up. And he does. He wakes up one of them. Kaundinya, Ajnatya Kaundinya. Okay, so... It's not easy to bring living beings to maturity because we, it's hard to face the truth, right? So that noble truth of suffering, of unsatisfying, the unsatisfying nature of a reality that's falling apart, 
hard to accept. My goodness. So, bodhisattvas go to the palaces of the devas. They go to the palaces of the dragons. They go to the palaces of name your spiritual being. Ye cha chen ta po a sho lo cha lo lo moha lo chi. Here they are, Tian Long Babu, according to one artist's rendition. Can't tell what they all look. Vaguely human, can't tell. How about this rendering? Here they are. Okay, uh, this is better. Okay, would these even have labels? Here's a deva. He's got his beard. He's got his whisk. Here's a dragon. <laughs> the dragon is all covered in clouds. Typical. Here's the yaksha. Yakshas are he's a ghost. Look at his. He's got a pole with uh, trophies dangling from it. Ye cha, they're called su ji gui, speedy ghosts. They, they are man eaters and woman eaters. Uh, Tendapo, okay, Gandharvas. Now, Gandharvas are very interesting. Their Gandharvas are called music spirits, and they, they are a, a, a musical band that plays for the devas on request. And what you give them is incense. They're also incense spirits. So when Chakra, again, we talked about Chakra, when he wants to throw a party and have music, he lights a particular kind of incense and the Gandharvas show up. But it's a mistake to assume that the Gandharvas are somehow pussies or, you know, they're just kind of fey musicians. They are fierce, scary spiritual beings with uh, their own powers and they it's they're not there for shock they're there for the incense and he's able to you know uh, invite them but the, there's there's stories about the Gandharvas that are terrifying and all of these beings are in their own realms are the, the leaders and we wouldn't want to mess with them if it weren't for the fact that they too put their palms together and bow to the Buddha. Uh, okay, so we had the Gandharvas. Ashura, here are the Ashuras. They are the ones who attack the devas in the heavens looking to take over. They long to be in charge of the heavens just like titans in Greek mythology. Get out your Edith Hamilton Greek mythology and read up about the Titans and you'll understand the Ashuras. They have huge bodies. They're assertive, incessant fighters. They love the conflict. They love the contest. And they're not easy to defeat. Now, Jalolo, <laughs> look down here. This one has wings. Why? This is called the Da Peng Jin Shi Niao, the great golden winged Peng bird. And Garuda Airlines, Indonesia's national carrier, is named after great Wolgum Pungbirds. In uh, other cultures' mythologies, they're known as rock, R O C, the rock. Uh, Zhuangzi talks about the rock who can flap his wings and travel over thousands of miles with a single flap. Master Hua uh, told us lots and lots of stories about the Da Peng Jin Shi Niao, the great golden winged Peng bird. They're the ones who eat dragons, that their diet is dragons, and the way that they eat dragons, particularly ocean-going dragons, is they flap their wings, and their wings are so expansive that as they flap, they can scoot the ocean water out of the way and reveal the dragons down in the bottom, and they swoop down and gobble the dragons like noodles. Master Hua would explain it. So there's a story there. Anyway, they, Garudas, also, uh, when they see the Buddha, they understand that the Buddha is free of birth and death. So the wisdom of these eightfold beings, this pantheon, surpasses people who still dream of luxury and comfort. The last one here is the Kinara, Jinolo. Kinaras are also music spirits. He's got a horn on his head, if you'll notice. 
That's, there's a horn. They're called doubtful spirits because their their nature is um, timid. Compared, but the Garudas and Kinaras are both. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Gandharvas and and Kinaras are both music spirits. He's got a pipa in his hand here. So finally, Mohalvachya, the one that looks like a snake. Maharagas are pythons, great boa type. And they are also fearsome. So the idea here, the whole principle behind this, this gallery of spiritual beings, and you know, I'm, do I see them? I don't see them. I'm reporting what I have heard. I'm just passing on the lore of the Tianlong Babu, is that these beings are as real as can be. It, this, there's no, this is not, you know, uh, fables. This is not fairy tales. It's not trying to scare us. When your spiritual vision is open, these beings are there, and when they show up, you, it's a good idea to show some deep respect because they are uh, serious about their cultivation. They want the Dharma. That's why they protect the Buddha. Uh, I remember on 1979, in November, when the city of 10,000 Buddhas had its grand opening, uh, the delegation from Malaysia, led by the Venerable K. Sri Damananda, had arrived. Uh, there was uh, the, uh, uh, we had commissioners from the city council in San Francisco had arrived, we had the mayor of Ukiah, we had these uh, monks from all directions were there. And the, the, the main, what's called the mountain gate, the main gate at City of 10,000 Buddhas was dedicated and the City of 10,000 Buddhas was officially opened. And that morning, we came in and, uh, oh, Ajahn Sumedho was also there, remember? Uh, Carol Ruth Silver from San Francisco, city councilor. The whole gang was there. And we came in to bow to Master Hua before uh, Marty and I kept bowing. And Shifu said, they're all here. He said, Tianlong Babu Dou Lai Le. Mei you Yi Ge Bu Lai, they all come to participate. He was so happy. He said, the gods, the dragons, and the Eightfold Pantheon are all here. None of them want to be left out. They're all here fighting for a seat to be part of this event. And I'm like, he said, oh, you can't see them? Uh, you can't see them, he said. Oh, too bad. So, now, when people hear Tianlong Babu, they're, they're, when they do, when there's drawings or artistic representations of them, they give them human bodies. But, uh, in fact, these are spiritual beings. Uh, that, that painting that I showed you is probably as close as I've seen to the actual how they must look. Now, that being said, there is another whole world around Tianlong Babu, which is the novel by the novelist known as Jin Yong. Uh, Jin Yong is, is this, no, that's not it, that's Master Hui now. Okay, um, here we go. History, there it is. Demigods and Semi-Devils, Tianlong Babu, um, by, here it is, Jin Yong is the famous, rightfully famous, uh, Hong Kong author who wrote this incredible novel called God's Dragons and Eightfold Pantheon, translated into English as Demigods and semi devils. <laughs> That's an English translation. It's an incredible book that many, 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 many millions of readers of Chinese novels have enjoyed and loved. And it's, it's a, this is one of the most uh, well known of what are called uh, wuxia xiaoshuo, martial arts novels. Gave rise to um, 
dozens of movies and television uh, versions of Tian Lung Babu. So when you say Tian Lung Babu, many people who have no knowledge of Buddhism will laugh because they've read the book, not realizing that the name, Jin Yong, borrowed the name from Buddhism to, uh, to give his novel some punch. And I have uh, read some of the translation, but I confess there's so many characters, it's really hard to keep track. And they all have their special fabao. They can, their Dharma treasure, they can make flames appear and cast them out, or a special blade, or a special martial arts move. You know. So, anyway, Tian Lung Babu. Now, this is, when we have the Avatamsaka, we have the actual source of the real Tian Lung Babu. And these, the gods, the dragons, and the Eightfold Pantheon. So, they, the Bodhisattvas go to where the Devas live, they go to where the dragons live, they go to where the ghosts, music spirits, titans, uh, golden-winged birds, music spirits, and python spirits live to teach them the Dharma. Go. Oh, okay. Furthermore, they went to the palaces of the gods, the Brahma gods in the form realm, the royal palaces where human kings live. The palaces where King Yama. Now, man, in this, as I told you, this little paragraph is so rich. King Yama is the lord of the underworld. And if we're doing comparative um, anthropology, my goodness, many, many advanced cultures will tell you that in between life in a human body and the afterlife, there's a court. Think of like penal system, like, you know, uh, where there's a judge. You come before a judge who evaluates your life in your human body and then sends you on. That interlude between this life and the next is part of many, 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 many stories. The Buddhist telling of it uh, gives us ten, a court with ten judges. There are ten King Yamas. Uh, many judges, no waiting. You, when it's your time, you go down, you see him, and he, the way the Buddha's system describes it, is there's a screen, and on that screen, all of your deeds are projected. You just, you know, they talk about your life flashes before your eyes at that moment. And here's the screen in an actual place where you, in between bodies, you're no longer in your previous body. You have been led down to this place by what's called the ghost of impermanence. And uh, there you are. And you can't bribe him. He does not accept bribes. They call him the iron-faced King Yama, Tie Mian, Lao Yan Jun, they say, and he's there and he's judging you. And there's an opportunity at that moment for those beings whom you have harmed, let's say, in your, in your last life. And they all want retribution. That's where they come to get revenge. And you may say, No, 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 you don't understand. I, I had to cook those chickens. And the chickens are there saying, uh-huh, yeah, you ate my body, why? You, know, you did. And they, so, the good and the evil that you've done are balanced out, weighed up, and King Yama goes, donk, you go off to be your next birth. So, that's the way the story goes. The King, the uh, Earth Store Bodhisattva Sutra describes it. And it's fascinating because, as Master Hua described it, uh, and the Earth Store Sutra described, it's a very bureaucratic process. It's just like going to file for a, you know, a, a building permit. You're going you're gonna to extend your, put another story in your house. And you have to apply City Hall to get the permit, and then you have to be inspected by the, for code and green tagged. And 
very much the same. The, the court of King Yama is very much the same. They make mistakes. You, they, you can, if you share a name with somebody and he dies, you can get pulled down by mistake, that sort of thing. Um, it's, it's quite a, quite a reality. And how come we don't remember the story that would go, at, as Master Hua and the Earth Store Sutra describes it, is every single time we die before our next rebirth, we have been through King Yama's place. Why don't we remember if that is true? And the answer is because it has something to do with the, the skandhas, the physical body, the emotions and sensations, the thinkings, the fifth, the fourth skanda, which is the metabolism, the processes that you know, keep us alive and in a body, and then consciousness itself all break apart and then reform with your next body. So that in between time, there's nothing that can remember that experience. Where our memories held, they're held in that intersection between the fourth and the fifth skanda. If that is in transition, because death is a process of the skandhas breaking up and then reforming in the womb for your next rebirth. In, in between, we wouldn't remember because there's nothing there to remember the, the, the functions that allow memory to happen and be recalled. Oh, I remember that. It's gone. So that's why we don't remember each round in the palace of King Yama. Um, over the years, listening to Master Hua describe this process, there were so many stories of people who uh, had near-death experiences and came back into the body that they left when, when the ghost of impermanence took them down, and the memories are fresh, and they describe being in a court, a uh, courtroom, and feeling the anxiety that pervades that, that space. Just, it's a terrifying experience because suffering is ahead. And if, you go, if he sends you to the hells, the hells are not far from there. And he can send you to the heavens as well. So there are stories of, uh, Master Hua would say, the very best thing is while you're alive, while you're in your body, memorize the Buddha Dharma, memorize the Heart Sutra, memorize, oh, if you know the Vajra Sutra, the Diamond Sutra from memory, you go down to King Yama and he says, tell me what you did. You say, I can recite the Vajra Sutra. King Yama will come down off his bench, put his palms together and say, please do. I want to hear it. And if you can recite it, he'll go, go back. You're back to the heaven. Your next rebirth is in the heavens. Well done. You know, because King Yama is like the Tianlong Babu, he is a functionary who wants to ascend. He wants to leave suffering as well. They are faithful Buddhists. So if they meet a cultivator, somebody who can recite the Great Compassion Mantra, the Sharangama Mantra, that's the very best because you get a golden ticket out of King Yama's realm. You get the express lane. They, they put you in first class. So that's the, that's the stories I've heard. So, animals, hungry ghosts, or hells. Notice that in this passage, it's stacked up vertically through the ten Dharma realms. Bodhisattvas go to the heavens. They go to the human realm. They go to uh, King Yama's realm in between, then to animals, ghosts, and hells the three evil destinies. Interesting that the bodhisattvas will go into the realms of animals to teach, the realms of ghosts to teach, and down in the hells to teach. That's a big-hearted teacher who goes into those places and helps them wake up. My goodness, with impartial, great compassion. That's the key word here, pingdang. They use impartial. That is to say, nobody gets a special teaching 
or more or less, everybody gets what they can understand, what they can accept, uh, and bodhisattvas want to gather them in. Here's our next verb. This verb was bring to maturity, changsho, to ripen them. This verb is shu shou, right? Shu, zhu zhong sheng, bring them in. That is to say, uh, puts them in a place where they can hear the Dharma. Which is what? That's an opportunity to leave suffering behind. And all of this is volunteer. These bodhisattvas are not paid. They're not on salary. And rarely do they even get acknowledged. Or worse, what do they say? There's no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> this, this happens. They, they're trying their best to help people wake up. And it's like, get out of my face. You're, you, you saw suffering all the time with you. Here, have a drink. Light up. Right? Oh, man. Huh. So, uh, what I thought I might do, just to break up the sound of my voice, I'm probably tired of listening, is we... Um, had a, an opportunity during the Guanyin session this last week to um, listen to some of the new Guanyin Bodhisattva songs. Um, here's one. This is not specifically a Guanyin song, it's more an Amitabha's song, but it can be adapted to Guan Yin. Uh, this is reciting the Buddha's name. Save creation, made a land where sufferings go, place of liberation. So use his vows and be reborn. Lotus flowers delighting, simply keep his name. Never stop reciting Saha lands a place of pain Struggle and contention To find a world of utmost First set your intention Those men or women show Rebirth not delighting Fly themselves with the single mind Never stop reciting The Buddha's compassionate vows, melodies unending. My body lives in a world of woe. My heart is world transcending with Bodhisattva's joyful. I'll soon be reuniting. Till I reach on top of land I'll never stop 
shining Until I reach Amitabha's name I'll never stop reciting Amo Reciting. It's not strictly an, a Guan Yin song, but it, it's got the same cast of characters in there. All righty. So we'll do a little more of our sutra here. This next paragraph. Here we go. Hoyo Jian Yi R Kao Fuja. Hoyo Wun Yi R Kao Fuja. Hoyo Yi Nian R Kao Fuja. Huo Wun Yin Sheng R Kao Fuja. Huo Wun Ming Hao R Kao Fuja. Huo Jian Yuan Guang R Kao Fuja. Huo Jian Guang Wang R Kao Fuja. Sui Zhu Zhong Sheng Xin Zhi So Yao. Jie Yi Qi So Ling Qi Huo Yi. Some beings, upon seeing them, became compliant and tamed. Others, upon hearing them, became compliant and tamed. Some, upon recalling them, became compliant and tamed. Some, upon hearing their voices, became compliant and tamed. Some, upon hearing their titles, became compliant and tamed. Some, upon seeing their, that could be halo, perfect light, became compliant and tamed. Some upon seeing their net of light became compliant and tamed. Thus, according to what all beings' hearts desired, they found them and benefited them. All right. Now, um, you see the pattern in this. Here's more of those, more of those um, verbs. We had bringing to maturity. We had gathering in. Here, it was found them and benefited them. They went to where they were and helped them out. That's another way of transferring, translating that. So these bodhisattvas go to where living beings are and use whatever makes them happy. Look at that. This is how bodhisattvas teach. Say. Followed according to what those living beings liked in their hearts, their hearts delights. That's how they teach. And man, oh man, uh, when I hear people threatening children, you better be good or you're going to fall in the hells, right? Chasing them away from Buddhism. They will never come back if you teach them by threatening them with spiritual danger. That's not what the Buddha did. What the Buddha said was bodhisattvas give people what they really want and entice them in to the Dharma. Make them happy. You don't scare them. Never mind. Buddhism of fear is just not a winning ticket, friends. So, some beings become compliant and tame, compliant and tame. What does it mean to be compliant and tame? Chao fu. Tamed, interesting. Um, we have not, we've been not t translating Tiao as tamed any longer. Um, we used, it used to be translated as tamed and subdued by our first wave of translation. And tamed and subdued sound like something nobody wanted. Right? Instead, brought into harmony, made harmonious, found their center got them into the flow. Um, what else? Um, found, found their, there was a, what's it called? Found your groove. They found their groove. That's much more in keeping 
with what bodhisattvas do. Some need to be tamed. Some are like arrogant and hard and trying to be bad. And maybe you tame them. But it's still a process of opening up their hearts and filling them with fullness that they discover in themselves. That's the thing. All the bodhisattva does is talk and model it. That's all you can do. You can model it yourself and you can say words that make sense. You can also give to them. You can also take the burden off them, work with them. Uh, so, <coughs> collaboration, working together, serving them, moving them through service. Those are all ways that you can teach. But uh, the goal is to open their hearts so that they themselves reach for the Dharma to set them free. That's the goal. They found them and I'm going to benefit you. <laughs> Is Shakespeare who says, right, if someone comes in the front door to help me, I will quickly exit the back door. So, um, to benefit them, that's, a, that's, that's not a good verb. V-E, to help, to be of service better. I'm going to benefit you. That's, yeah, we need to retranslate that. Nonetheless, the point is, these bodhisattvas in these two paragraphs, look at what it says about bodhisattvas. This is the Buddha. He's in the Jada Grove. He's about to speak the other part of the Avatamska Sutra, last chapter. And he's taken a lot of time to praise bodhisattvas and talk about how incredible they are using all these skillful means. Uh, to do what? To bring us to maturity, to gather us in, to bring us into harmony, and to help us out. That's what bodhisattvas do. Sounds like a good life to me. I, this appeals. And that's just very attractive. Here is, this is a bodhisattva known as a mother. <laughs> She's got four, count them, four, three. Three hungry babies. This is a kurawang. She's got one beak full of food and she's going to have to satisfy all three of them. And she will. She doesn't quit. Look how, like, yeah, matter of fact, mom is not moved. The babies are like, I'm dying of hunger. The mom is like, here, eat this. <laughs> she's, she's good at it. All right. Um, I have a story here. This is uh, this is not so much about. Well, I'll just read it anyway. So we were bowing along in uh, 1977. This was. This happened in uh, near Santa Barbara, California. There's a. This is a from Marty's. Uh, Bhikshu Hung Chao's journal. There's this line from the Autumnska that says, Chung Sheng Xin Jing, So Jian Di Jing. When living beings' thoughts are pure, the lands they see are fully purified. Um, there was this, we were bowing, and there was this guy uh, standing behind a tree watching. And he was motionless, he was just standing there. And he was there in the morning, he was there in the afternoon, and he was there in the evening. And when the day was over, uh, he came up to talk. And he uh, stopped. And he said, here, one word. And he handed it to, to Marty. And it was feathers with a string tied to their, the shaft of the feather. He said, this is the tail feather of the spotted eagle. And there's some sage and it was tied to it. He says, uh, I was told to give this to you by the medicine teacher of the Rosebud Sioux in South Dakota. He says, it's from all my relatives. Here it is. And you could see that that was a lot of words for this guy. He was not a talker. And uh, he handed it to us. And then, gone. He just vanished. And the next day, he came back, and he said, I was 
told to say some more. I'm going to give you some more words, he said. Because uh, I reported to my teacher what you were doing. And he said, he is the medicine teacher of the Rosebud Sioux at the present. He says, you guys are neat. He says, that's the word. You're neat. When you're neat, you slip right through. You don't make waves. There are no problems. He said, I myself, I'm not there yet. I'm not neat. But I want to get your kind of commitment one day, he said. You're neat. You put your whole selves into it. That's, that's what my teacher calls neat. He says, uh, I'm always learning. And it's right there in front of you. And yet it's hard to see it. You don't see it. He says, my eyes are open wide. I feel a big change in the people around here and the spiritual vibes in the whole area the last couple of days. I hope it lasts. I think it will. He said, there's really not much time left. There's lots of different paths, but they all take us to the same place. I hope we can all meet together soon in the hoop. He was very sincere. And he, as he left, he said, these feathers are from my extended family to protect you on your journey. There are 10,000 Sioux Indians in the Rosebud Reservations praying for you. So the, the theme is um, Bodhisattvas traveling where living beings live to teach them how to be uh, homeless, I guess, because the the, the thing that the Bodhisattva wants to give to us has no... Uh, is, he wants us to free us of a place. The, where, where would a Bodhisattva live? We heard about Guanyin Bodhisattva with her uh, 32 transformations. The Universal Door chapter is talking about that. And, and here are these Bodhisattvas who can divide their bodies and go anywhere. And in the next couple of paragraphs below in the sutra, it makes it clear that the bodhisattvas, as they are doing this thing that the Buddha is describing, never leave the jade grove. And that's one of those... So, the bodhisattvas are sitting in the jade grove around the Buddha, waiting for the Buddha to teach. And the Buddha is saying, look at these bodhisattvas, how they're able to go with all these expedient means out everywhere to teach, from the hells to the heavens, and everywhere in between, gods and dragons and yakshas, garudas, maharagas, kinaras, etc., and humans and the rest, and yet they stay right there in the Jada world. And that's one of those aspects of the Avatamsaka that is, comes up over and over again about how bodhisattvas want to learn from the Buddha and they're always traveling to different worlds wherever the Buddha announces time to teach the lotus, time to teach about Amitabha, time to teach the Sharangama teachings, time to teach the Vinaya. And the Bodhisattvas go attend to learn how to be better Bodhisattvas and yet they don't move. Hmm. That's fascinating. That's real Avatamsaka Buddha Dharma. So, what's going on? Uh, can't tell you. I wish I knew. Maybe someday. Someday I'll learn how that actually works. But it has to do with the um, this thing called the, the three bodies principle, the trikaya, the Dharma body, the wisdom body, and the transformed bodies. These are the transformed bodies. And they function incredibly uh, efficiently and they flex and the Buddha Dharma is there surrounding each individual living being to the point where we can pick it up uh, so the question remains where does a Bodhisattva live where are, are they homeless perfectly homeless the, the question that follows up is what lives there so you got an address, but the address is for a body. 
And the body, if the body is constantly reforming each according to a living being, is it the eighth consciousness that is the... But the eighth consciousness has been emptied of seeds of karma. So once it something, you know, we're, we need a better description of answering the question, who am, who am I, who are we? Well, while we're in, while our, we still have debts to repay, then we definitely have a place. And we respond to, at the end of this life to wherever the vector forces of the debts we owe push us to repay those debts. That's where we go, and we have a place. And then we suffer, we die, and we come back. At a certain point, they say the Buddha is ye jin qing kong. His karma is ended, and his emotions are over. They don't push him or her anymore. And at that point, I'm assuming that the theory goes, your eighth consciousness has been emptied out. You're, you've endured your karma, and you're not creating any more negative karma. So at that point, your address can be wherever you're needed. Your, where do you live? It's nowhere and everywhere at once. You are tong ti da bei, same body, great compassion with all living beings. So wherever living beings are is where you live. And yet you can light up here and light up there and light up there as needed to go and teach. And then when that teaching job is over, you're, you're done. Something like that. That's, this is a post-doc uh, dissertation topic. Are bodhisattvas permanently homeless is the question. Um, and yet that home is home in the universe, home in the Dharma realm. Home, 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 Dharma realm, where the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas all play, wherever is heard. Yeah. So, uh, I notice, let's see here, I notice that Jin Weisher is back from Europe, and he's shown up on my Zoom. Maybe if I share my screen and bring up the... BBM website, will Jin Weisher magically appear and speak to us? Yes, I'm here. Bonjour. Bonjour, ça va bien? <laughs> yes, yeah, happy to return. And we are here in Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. And just happy to announce a few events what's going to happen in the next weeks. Oh boy. Yeah, the first one is a uh, little bit further. Uh, it's November 7th. It's there this it is. Tuesday. Yeah. Ajahn hey. Amaro. And Amaro. Uh, Abbot of Amarawati and a good friend who used to come every Tuesday 10 yep. years ago, I guess. Yep. <laughs> uh, since the Abhagiri started in 1995. So he will met he will meet uh, old friends and some people have a chance to see him first time. Highly recommended. This is one of the the most recognized teachers in the West. Right now he's uh, coming to, to offer his teaching. It will be tea and Dhamma okay. uh, at 5 p.m. So it's more uh, less uh, formal kind of format that people can ask questions. I'm assuming that will be pretty packed. So Will, if someone yeah. wants to come, I recommend tea will be a talk at 7.30 to 9. So it will be November 7th, this Tuesday. Okay. Hmm. That would be uh, Wednesday here. And 7.30 p.m. California is now 1.30 p.m. in Australia. And okay. For, mm -hmm, for those who will uh, miss that talk it will be recorded so on our channel uh, YouTube channel okay. so definitely yep. an opportunity okay. to watch later okay mm, and uh, Dharma can return yes to the top is uh, a special talk uh, given by Professor Marty Verhoeven and he, he, he will see his picture and uh, now and how it was before, uh, years back. Mm -hmm. 
and um, uh, Professor Marty Verhoeven will uh, give an, a special talk when we talk about Buddhism and social engagement. And this is the online event, and people have to sign up to join, and it will be via Zoom. Uh, the link is the register at this link on the end of the text. Yes, people can go exactly. So this is uh, going to happen on Thursday, not this week, but next week. And uh, tomorrow, uh, Robert Hank Schur will have a, another lecture uh, about Avatam Saka Sutra. <laughs> from the Hold down to get there. Wait. Oh, oh, there we go. Yes, right there. CTTB channel. Right. Mm, ten transferences ten chapter. Transferences chapter. I'll look yes, by stories of Master, Master Shrinzong stories as well. It follows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So this is going to happen tomorrow, 7.30. And all the our classes and the, another Friday is from 1 to 2 p.m. California time. Master uh, Xu Yun biography. Mm -hmm. Victoria biography. Time. Right there. There it is. Exactly. Yep. And, and all the classes are, we have, uh, you know, this is like the, the semester definitely begin. And all the classes are offered by other teachers like uh, Steven Tainer on Wednesday. This is also via Zoom. People, if wish, can join. And Friday is Professor Marty Verhoeven, 7.30, start with meditation. And yep. uh, also is. he is lecturing on Avatamsaka Sutra. Mm -hmm. And I think this is mostly it. Okay, what's happening with uh, the BGR event? Oh, that's over. Oh, this has happened oh, already. Oh, so I missed we need it. To, I could have announced that last week. So they, yeah, we have a chance amongst other uh, teachers and people who put their heart and effort to support uh, the BGR operation. It is quite mind-blowing that mm -hmm. uh, the level of support and education, and very often they have support education, people who use, don't used to have an access Mainly did you, uh, girls. Did you um, did you join that from Europe? Yes, we joined this from, Par Were from you on, Paris. You Paris. Europe? From Paris. Okay. We joined. We have Great. short slot. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. All righty. Yes, is 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 uh, we ask it will be recorded, so maybe we can post somewhere. Yeah. Very I short mean, our presentation, but maybe it's good to to show that. See. Okay, that would be good, right? Okay, so Ajahn Amaro, then Marty is coming up on the 16th. That's uh, 11, that's two weeks from now, so. Yes, it's two weeks from now. Mm -hmm. All right, Jim Weisher, thank you for that. And appreciate the, the news. Um, we will conclude today with a dedication of merit. Um, oh, there must have, maybe yes. uh, you, bet. Uh, you mentioned probably about that that we're changing time here in California, right? And daylight saving. So one hour will be to, at, you, at 2 a.m. 2 a.m. 2 a.m., yes. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Just, yeah, it's always a Sunday, early Sunday morning when it changes. Early yeah. Sunday morning, yeah. Okay. Yep. And it's... Okay. Uh, it will be... It's an hour ahead. Is that how you do it? Spring ahead, fall behind. So... Okay, thank you that for the announcements. And okay, thank you. You bet. Time to dedicate merit. And my goodness, um, pick your disaster and make it better with your heart. Here we go. <laughs> Every living being 
Our minds as one and radiant with light Share the fruits of peace With hearts of goodness, luminous and bright If people hear and see How hands and hearts can find in giving unity May our minds away to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light Dispel the darkness of our endless night Because our hearts are one This world of pain turns into paradise May all become compassionate and wise May all become compassionate and why we can bow to the Buddhas if you want to join me please do Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. Express my gratitude to the volunteers who made this lecture possible and those who translated it into languages for the world. Amitofo. <laughs>